Thank you. Um, I'm hoping my slides will come up. It's my pleasure today to be here, to be able to talk to you about the deep ocean, its biodiversity, and the frontiers and challenges faced by that biodiversity in the 21st century. So I, I will discuss a bit about discovery of deep ocean biodiversity and why it's important, and the threats faced by biodiversity from industrialization of the deep and also climate change in the deep sea, and then talk about how we can align our climate and biodiversity goals for a sustainable ocean. So when I refer to the deep ocean, I am speaking of the ocean below 200 meters. This is basically most of the ocean and most of the habitable volume on the planet, it covers two thirds of the planet. And we often refer to it as oh, automatically advancing, which is not a good thing. Can I go back? Uh, yep. It, it's not a single ecosystem, although we usually refer just to the deep sea. Um, we have come to understand that the deep sea is comprised of many, many different ecosystems. Over the last 50 to 70 years, we've discovered areas, vast areas of low oxygen uh, along our mar continental margins beneath upwelling zones. We've discovered vast abyssal plains below the low productivity areas of the ocean. We've discovered tens of thousands of underwater volcanoes called seamounts and thousands of canyons and fjords that cut our continental margins. And these all host lush gardens of diverse filter feeding animals. Uh, we've discovered chemosynthetic ecosystems like uh, methane seeps and hydrothermal vents that rely on chemical energy rather than sunlight and photosynthesis. We've explored the deepest parts of the ocean, the trenches. We've discovered that dead whales form community, specialized communities, and that cold water coral uh, and sponge reefs form vast areas that extend for kilometers and support biodiversity. So all of these ecosystems have their own highly adapted species. Many of these systems uh, uh, exhibit extreme conditions. We heard from Martin about heat waves and so on. Well, there are parts of the ocean that are always hot. We have animals living at the highest known temperatures on life. Uh, the animal life can occur at hydrothermal vents. We have animals that can calcify in the lowest known pHs in the deep sea. We have animals that can tolerate normally toxic hydrogen sulfide levels at methane seep. We have animals that can live in the lowest known oxygen conditions uh, and still survive. And we have animals in our deep trenches that can survive at extraordinarily high pressures. So these superpowers are an important part of evolution in the deep sea. There are other animals that have symbiotic bacteria that can digest wood or can digest whale bones. But my favorite superpowers are the powers of extreme longevity. The deep sea fishes often live for 100 or 150 years, older than people. We have Greenland sharks that can live for 400 years and deep sea tube worms for 300 years. But all of these are in fact very, very young compared to some of the deep sea corals and sponges that can literally live for thousands of years. They were alive when the pyramids were built in Egypt and, and long before. We are also in a time of discovery about the functions of the ocean. Uh, in the last 10 years, we have found that different ocean ecosystems serve as nursery grounds that help produce the pr productivity of the ocean. We found rockfish living in sponges. We found fish larvae living in, in amongst the stinging tentacles of sea pens. We found octopus that uh, by many octopus that let, uh, brood their eggs in warm seamounts. We found skates and rays laying their eggs at vents and seeps. And we've even found deep sea snailfish laying their eggs in giant protozoa. So all of these systems that we are just now discovering turn out to have unexpected nursery functions. And we're coming to understand that the deep 
see biodiversity provides a service in many different ways. We know that genetic diversity in the deep sea provides potential to adapt to change. There are enzymes produced by deep sea animals that have been employed now to break down lipids in cold water detergents or provide UV resistance in skin lotions. There are animals, especially sponges, that produce metabolites with antibiotic, anti-cancer, and anti-inflammatory properties. We are uh, looking at uh, deep sea organisms as a source of biomaterials, sponge fiber optics with special conducting properties. We're looking at deep sea bamboo corals as a template for bone grafts, or the scaly foot snail at Benz for their uh, unusual uh, tensile properties for armor. There are deep sea animals that provide anti-fouling capabilities or detoxification of methylmercury. There are cellulases used in fermentation, pyrolases in fracking. We're looking at tube worm blood with a very high oxygen affinity as a template for artificial human blood. Uh, we're looking at microorganisms that can scrub CO2 to tackle climate change. And this is just a little part of the potential of deep sea biodiversity. But we've also discovered that this biodiversity produces non-living resources and living resources that we're interested in exploiting. So for example, in oxygen minimum zones, there are phosphorite sequestered that we're now interested in harvesting for fertilizer. Um, many of the environments in abyssal plains, on seamounts, and at hydrothermal vents produce um, mineral-rich substrates that have cobalt, zinc, copper, nickel, and other metals that we need for our electronics, for the green energy transition, for electric car batteries, and, and there's interest in mining these. Um, we've discovered the canyons uh, ha uh, accumulate organic matter that turns into oil and gas over millions of years, and we're now extracting this. And we have found uh, aggregations of fish at seamounts, at methane seeps, and uh, around our sponge and, and coral reefs. And we are uh, harvesting deep sea fishes. And we're even looking now at harvesting the very small mesopelagic fishes that migrate by the billions up and down in the water column every day. We have come to understand the deep sea provides very important regulating services on this planet. It takes up most of the excess heat in, in the, well, the ocean takes up the excess heat, and a lot of that ends up in the deep sea. And the uh, biological pump uh, uh, acts to remove, transport, transform, and bury carbon in the deep sea. There's also remineralization and nutrient cycling that enables the productivity of the ocean. So we can think about all our deep sea ecosystems um, in terms of carbon services. And this is only just beginning to happen. We understand that deep sea is transporting carbon out away from the atmosphere to help um, combat climate change. We know that there are a variety of ecosystems uh, close to the margins that have very high carbon sequestration rates. And there are other areas far from the margins that are so vast that the amounts of carbon sequestered are very low. We know the animal biomass sequesters carbon in the deep sea. And we've come to understand that at methane seeps, where methane naturally is coming from beneath the Earth's crust, there are microbes and animals that are both oxidizing and removing that methane, and some microbes that turn it into carbonate rock. And we've come to understand that hydrothermal vents are fertilizing the ocean um, and uh, help maintain its very high productivity. Other values of the deep sea include the cultural services. We value that we have education and scientific research in the deep sea, but also the arts, film, literature, um, art. We have. Uh, the deep sea provides a space for communication cables and, and a little bit for tourism as well. And I've come really only in the last few years to understand that we also have cultural heritage and traditional knowledge as a service of the deep sea. There are a variety of indigenous people with ancestral connections to the deep ocean. Many indigenous and local peoples consider themselves to be resource custodians of the deep and rely on the deep ocean for aspects of marine navigation and traditional medicine. And we're just now thinking about how to 
build uh, these services alongside our Western science. But despite the fact that uh, we know all these things I've just told you, all of this knowledge base derives from studying less than 10% of the deep ocean with respect to biology and ecology. This means that most of the deep sea species remain undiscovered and undescribed, and I would bet that there are entire ecosystems that remain undiscovered in the deep sea. And this means we probably don't know about all the inf important functions and services. And yet, despite this lack of knowledge, our biodiversity in the deep sea is under threat from bottom trawling and overfishing, from oil and gas extraction and contamination, from uh, waste disposal, and potentially from deep seabed mining. And um, I would say that all of these activities create disturbance. Uh, there is physical, direct physical disruption of the seabed, but also disruption of the water column from suspended sediment plumes. There is altered substrate and contamination associated with these activities, a loss of structure and altered food web. So we are now facing a situation where we risk destruction of the deep sea biodiversity before we discover and understand uh, what is actually there. And a, a good analogy is the rainforest. Um, coral and sponge reefs are often referred to as the rainforest of the deep. They are uh, very long lived, like terrestrial forests and like for Amazon forests. They have high biodiversity. They have a lot of biopharmaceutical potential, but they're very vulnerable to disturbance. And um, this vulnerability comes especially from bottom trawling, um, which can leave track marks and reduce areas to rubble. It can pull up corals that are thousands of years old. And it can leave fishing gear that acts as to ghost fish, effectively capturing fish uh, with, that are never recovered. Another threat to the deep sea comes from oil and gas extraction, which has been occurring in deeper and deeper waters over time. And it's now routine to extract oil and gas from below 3,000 meters. The most famous of these extraction rigs is the Deepwater Horizon, which blew out in 2010 and created a large uh, area of damage in coastal waters and the deep sea. Uh, per, it oiled many of the habitat, providing corals, and damaged some of the methane seeps in the region. And as we now understand, those seeps provide important services in terms of methane capture, carbon sequestration. They have microbes that degrade oil, and they are aggregations for fish a, a site and fisheries production as well. And then another threat facing the deep ocean is human contamination and pollution. Sometimes that contamination is intentional. For example, the DDT waste barrel you see dumped off Southern California, there are literally tens, there are more than 10,000 to 100,000 of these barrels there put out in the 1950s and 40s, 50s, and 60s. There's unintentional trash that accumulates, such as the pile you see off Costa Rica in the deep sea. And we've discovered there are contaminants in the deepest dwelling animals in our deep sea trenches. In the Marianas Trench, the amphipods have high levels of PCBs and mercury contamination. So we've managed to reach all corners of the deep ocean. And we are now just poised uh, to carry out deep seabed mining, motivated by the need for uh, minerals for electric car batteries and electronics and green energy. Um, and so we're looking at mining, and there are international contracts in international waters for polymetallic sulfides and massive sulfides at, uh, uh, at vents and polymetallic press on seamounts. Um, this area off the off of Mexico, the Clarion Clipperton zone has 20 contracts from many different countries. And we are just beginning to learn about the biodiversity of this area. It turns out that half of the biodiversity lives on the nodules you see here that have been targeted for extraction for their minerals. And we do know that deep sea bed mining will endanger biodiversity. The IUCN's first red listed species in the deep sea is the scaly foot snail, which has an, a 
very restricted distribution and only occurs in areas that have been contracted out for deep sea bed mining. Uh, but alongside these, uh, what I call the industrialization of the deep ocean, all these human threats, we have threats from climate change. Uh, you heard from Martin, the ocean takes up very large amounts of excess heat. This changes stratification and solubility and leads to oxygen loss and reduced productivity. And it takes up um, a, almost a third of our CO carbon dioxide, and this leads to ocean acidification. And all of this happens at the surface, but it does not stay there. It is changing the deep sea. We have one highly interconnected ocean, and thermohaline circulation is transporting surface waters to uh, great depth. And as a result, the deep ocean is warming. This is causing many changes uh, in distribution. Most of them we don't track, but the tuna we know are migrating east in the Pacific and shoaling, their habitat is shoaling with a very important consequences for the income of the Western Pacific Island nations that depend on tuna for a large part of their income. Uh, oxygen loss in the ocean is changing food webs. Occasionally it causes mass mortalities, but we know it's compressing the habitat of big billfish like marlin and sail swordfish which have a high oxygen requirements. They're moving into shallow water, becoming more vulnerable to overfishing. Oxygen loss causes loss of biodiversity, but also some climate feedback and extensive um, nitrous uh, oxide production, another greenhouse gas. And ocean acidification is threatening our deep water coral ecosystems, um, largely through dissolution of the non-living parts of coral. We think the living parts may adapt to some extent but much of the deep water coral reefs and biodiversity st promoting structure is non-living. So we're at a point where industrialization of the deep ocean is bringing stress from climate change and resource extraction at the same time. We know we need deep sea science to underpin uh, our policies to have ocean sus a sustainable ocean. And there are a variety of kinds of ways that scientists can contribute. You heard Martin talk about the uh, global assessments um, in the, the uh, SROC, the Ocean and Cryosphere in a Changing Climate Report from the IPCC. We've hi highlighted and identified risk to four of the deep ocean ecosystems. I think that's a first for IPCC reporting. Um, but deep sea scientists uh, can contribute tremendously to biodiversity conservation by working with the UN agency. So, the CBD and the BBNJ are interested in identifying protected areas, protect 30% of the ocean. Um, we can work with the FAO to identify vulnerable marine ecosystems and with the International Seabed Authority to identify the APIs, areas protected from mining. I think a very important element of this is using our climate projections and um, understanding of climate velocity and time of emergence and all of that to prioritize areas that can serve as climate refugia and build that into our protected area design. So we are at a point where we need to be mainstreaming both climate and biodiversity goals in our stewardship of the deep ocean. And we can do that through climate smart fisheries, through different environmental management practices, including identifying climate and biodiversity loss as cumulative impacts, and through efforts to maintain ecosystem services. So this is my final slide. I, I think the deep ocean is critical to future ocean sustainability, and I'll leave you with really three messages. We need to explore the deep ocean before we exploit it, not after. Uh, we need more ocean observations to be able to predict and conserve, and we need a mentality of stewardship of the deep ocean to save all of the services I've been talking about and the ones we haven't discovered yet for future generations. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for your input. Any observation? Okay. Uh, congratulations. Very, very interesting new thing. 
Uh, I want to know in how way the nuclear test have influence in the health of the ocean, also in the deeply ocean. Nuclear test, nuclear proof. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know about nuclear testing. I do know that the chemical fallout from nuclear testing is in the deep ocean sediments. It's sometimes used as a, um, a paleo or, or a time zone. You know, we can tell when it was deposited based on nuclear testing, but I don't know uh, much about uh, the effects on the deep sea ecosystems. I, Radioactive waste dumping was a very big thing uh, 50 years ago, and there are parts of the ocean with a lot of radio barrels of radioactive waste, and I think those also are a potentially a problem. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, the United Nations have predicted that one million species will become a in the next uh, decade. Uh, and we speak a lot about biodiversity and models and predicting and so on. Uh, do you have knowledge of how many species are already extinct in the ocean? Do you, because we release numbers, but if you want to see what's behind these numbers, the knowledge is very scant. Sorry, it keeps going off, okay. Uh, I think we have very small knowledge. We know the vaquita, for example. We know about marine mammals that are endangered in the ocean. But most, as I said, we have yet to discover most of the species of the ocean, in the ocean. Every time I go to a new place, almost all the species are undescribed species. So we could easily be creating extinctions that we don't know about. And I think that one million number is really mostly focused on land-based species, not the ocean. It can be more. Any other? Thanks, Lisa. Amazing presentation. And very important to all of us, given the, the relevance of the deep sea in the blue planet. Um, Martin was mentioning uh, some potential tools to contrast climate change, which is impacted the, the deep sea. My concern is, are there impacts of the geotechnical solutions that are, you know, being, for instance, um, ocean fertilization, iron fertilization, phosphor fertilization, um, particle sequestration, uh, kaolin, spread all over all of these, you know, like pollutants you showed us, uh, these will return to the deep sea. So are we aware of the potential threat, opportunities and risk of that, you know, technique? I, I had this on one of my slides, and in my rush to try to make my 20 minutes, I forgot to discuss this. But it's an incredibly important area of science now to address the side effects or the impacts on the deep ocean of the many different carbon dioxide removal methods that have been proposed. And nearly all of them involve the deep sea in some way, with the idea that it's just a dumping ground for carbon dioxide. So ocean fertilization, macroalgal culture and sinking, crop waste disposal in the deep sea, CO2 injection into deep water or the deep seabed. All of these have been proposed as climate intervention methods, and all of them will have major impacts on deep sea ecosystems um, and really need to be thought through before we start this on a massive scale. So thank you for bringing that up because I, I totally forgot to mention that. Yeah. Okay. 